The following is a presentation of Muddy River Sports. It's time once again to break down. This is the Muddy River Breakdown, along with my trusty sidekick, Benji Marth. I'm Shuckles, the editor. <laughs> I got a lot of people telling me. <laughs> I had people uh, texting me about uh, it. They go, next time I see Matt, I can't wait to call him Shuckles. I'm Muddy River Sports editor Matt Shuckman <laughs> alongside Ben Marth, Benji and Shuckles. That's, That's our, that right. should be our new podcast name. Correct. <laughs> I think it sounds better, Shuckles and Benji. Okay, either way. Well, I mean, you're the leader anyway, so I'll just be the follower. I, I, I should be the sidekick. You should be the leader. <laughs> We're going to talk later. Yes. Top five favorite play-by-play guys. Now, that we could go a, a, a variety of ways when we get to this ranking. It could be, and again, these are our favorites. That's how we're doing it. We're not doing, these are the five best of all time. These are the guys that we want to listen to. Right. There might be a surprise in my list. Oh, my gosh. A surprise. A surprise. Wow. That, isn't that not enough to listen to this entire podcast? Exactly. Right. So, again. Later, I've got two lists, by the way. Two? Yes. Okay. Did you split it radio and TV? I did not. Okay. I did <laughs> of all time. My favorites of all time oh, and my okay. favorite current. Okay. Mine are... I guess Again. you could kind of intermingle those. Yeah, my, my, my top five was kind of intermingled, but I know I could do a top five of all time and top five current really very easily. Yes. So we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that here in a few minutes. But we're going to talk basketball off the top because we both got to enjoy a tremendous weekend of basketball. I know you had to go club volleyballing yes. on Saturday with your daughter. The Quincy University commit. Thank you. Yes. Lily Marth. Correct. Future Hawk. <laughs> and... Uh, chasing her around the Midwest in her volleyball career. Right. But Friday night, you got to see four games at the pit in the Quincy shootout. Friday night, I got to see four games at Blue Double Gym mm -hmm. in the Quincy shootout. And then I got to see nine games on Saturday. And boy, was it fun. It was exceptional basketball. Yes. Again, I got to see four games, seven teams that I don't ever get to see. Right. Um, it was fabulous to say the least i was disappointed i didn't get to go saturday because i went last year and the saturday at blue devil gym is obviously the pinnacle of the weekend yep. and to be able to sit there like you do from 8 a.m to 11 p.m or whatever that looks like that's what it was, was pretty cool <laughs> i mean it, it, if you're like you've talked about so many times if you're a basketball junkie i mean that's the place to be and, and i can sit here i obviously i'm working so I'm, I'm covering the game so i am there somewhat required to be for my job i would be there anyway that's the thing. I would I would be there all day. I would if I was a fan. I would go for all those games. Now I would have the opportunity to go grab something to eat, leave for a bit, take a break. I don't get that opportunity working it, which is just fine. But the number of people who walked out of there at ten thirty after that final game was over, who had been there since nine a.m. when the first game tipped, was amazing. How many people were still there for that last game who had been there all day? Who had done you know? Yeah, they maybe hadn't sat in the same seat for 14 hours because they'd gone, you know, gotten something to eat and moved, talk, moved around talks, you know, that sort of stuff. But the, the number of people who went, who stayed for all nine games was impressive. Isn't that something? It's awesome. It, the fact that people want to be there to see all these teams, to see all these matchups was really cool. And to see the, the, the crowd grow as the day went on. And I'm not talking – little bits here you go from a few hundred at the 9 a.m game to maybe you know a couple hundred more by by noon and all that stuff no i mean it got loud it got large and it stayed large best crowds in the five quincy shootouts best crowds ever hmm. no doubt about it that's good news yeah consistent i mean the thing is you always have great crowds for the blue devil game on friday night and saturday night this time it was packed to the rafters on friday night and darn close to that on Saturday. And Saturday, it was packed. I, you know, you could find a seat, but it was pretty packed for most of the day. That was the thing that was impressive to me is from a, from a fan standpoint is how many people were there and stayed there for multiple games. They didn't just show up to watch their team play. Obviously, like in Ellsbury or Southeastern, they came at 9 a.m. And some of those people were still there at 10 p.m. Mm. Uh, some left and came back. The Southeastern team went, got something to eat. She went and showered, did all that. Later on, I look up, and the whole, almost the whole team's sitting there watching games later in the day. Um, you had area teams show up. And, you know, I talked to some of the people from Camp Point Central 
who were there watching. Um, you, you saw saw a myriad of Notre Dame kids there mm-hmm. on Saturday, uh, and a bunch of Notre Dame people there on Friday night earlier to see some of the some of the other teams. Um, it was impressive. It was the the crowds. Kudos, kudos, kudos to the basketball fans in this community because you made it clear that it mattered. Let's get into some of the teams and some of the players that really stood out. Again, I saw the four games at Notre Dame, and I saw what I thought was overall the most impressive team from my standpoint. And I think, Shuckman, you got to, obviously you got to see them Saturday night. Uh, Staley out of Kansas City I thought was just a phenomenal basketball team. I mean, you got to see some of the academies and some of the teams I didn't get to see from a high school perspective. Staley with their seven seniors, with their veteran coach, with their uh, with just their overall moxie, their physical ability, their length, their ability to get up on the fl- up and down the floor. They go six nine, six seven, six six in the front court. Um, you know, I thought overall uh, to see them play late at night on a Friday night against the Burlington School out of North Carolina, who was got into some foul trouble and struggled, and Staley took complete advantage of it and just overwhelmed this Burlington school team who came in with a impressive record in its own right, lost their coach last year, who I believe went to prolific prep in California from the Burlington school. Right. Just to see this Staley team, I mean, and I even I texted you late Friday yeah. night. I said, Chuck, this team is good. I will second that, third that, fourth that, <laughs> and, and not just because they beat Quincy High School on, on Saturday night. It's the way they did it. You know, Quincy High School – has taken on high-level teams in, this year and in the past. But the way Staley dominated them physically, the way Staley got the ball inside against that zone early, I mean, Staley made its first seven shots. Three of those were dunks. I mean, it, it was impressive the way they ran their offense, the way they shared the basketball. Fundamentally, they're as good as any team I've seen this year, either side of the river. Um. I will be shocked. I won't be shocked if they don't win a, a Class 6 state title because you never know who you run into. That's a brutal, they, brutal class. Exactly. So you never know who you're going to run into in the postseason. So I don't think there's anything that would truly shock any of us. Yeah. But I wouldn't be surprised if they win a state title. They're that good. I they're, can't imagine there are more teams, Chuck, in that Class 6 that can present right. what they do. I think Knicks is behind them in the polls. Mm-hmm. Oak Park is in there somewhere. CBC may be in there yeah, in some you, range. Somebody out of St. Louis is going to come and come through there yeah. and potentially challenge them. Is Shaman out of Class 6 team? I don't think so. I and think they're, they're not even – they're five. They're, they're not five, even state ranked. I mean, they're receiving votes. And, and to me, they were – They were fun to watch. They were – if I had a 1A and 1B for most impressive, it was Chaminade and Staley. Chaminade worked the ball efficiently, uh, shot the ball great. Yeah, um, but the, the just the way they ran their stuff, uh, ran their offense, ran their sets, I mean, everything was crisp. Everything was clean. Everything, guys were in the right spots. I mean, yes, they're young. And Jahidi White's kid, kid twins are yeah. freshmen. But they're really talented, you know. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to speak with Jameson. Yeah. Uh, White after the game, as long, along with Frank Bennett II, the, the, the Chaminade coach. Um, great conversations, but it, it was neat. Jahidi White was there. I was going to say, I talked to him Friday night yeah. at the pit. He was sitting at midcourt on the first row, uh-huh. and I haven't same, seen same him. Same Saturday. That's where he – Seen him or talked to him since he played at Cardinal Ritter with Lauren Woods and Chris Carrowell. Yeah. And that Cardinal Ritter bunch – and I got to talk to Johnny because I, I watched him. I mean, we, we we graduated same year, right. and I knew of those Ritter teams. I played against Chris Carwell growing up. I got to talk to him um, about not only Chaminade, but his days. And, uh-huh. and I didn't realize he was roommates with Allen Iverson at, at Georgetown. At Georgetown, yeah. They were roommates. Yeah. And he told me, I said, man, that just that, that must have been amazing. I said, and we talked about his pro career. and I think six years in the NBA. Seven years in seven. the NBA. Played with four teams, three yeah. or four teams. I think it was, it was drafted by the Nuggets out of I college. I can't remember. I know he played, I know he played the Suns for the and a couple of other teams. Yeah. And I said, man, it must have been something to watch Iverson and play alongside him and to roommate with him as well. And he goes, yeah, man. He goes, he left a year before I did. He goes, I'd have left the same time if he hadn't taken all the shots. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you forget? And, and and it was neat to see how many kids in Blue Devil Gym were going up to the players, Link Academy, you know, some of the kids from Vashon. St. Rita. St. Rita, to get autographs afterward. 
And so you know they know who these guys are. They know that they've signed with Division One programs. That there there's that level. But what you forget at times is they're just dudes. And 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 you're talk, having that conversation with Jahidi White. Mm-hmm. Remind you of that. Like you're talking about him rooming with Allen Iverson. Well, they're just two dudes playing college basketball who were in the dorm together or in the apartment together. High profile, obviously, but I'm sure they did some of the same stupid stuff in college that we did. We just didn't have a roommate that went on to play in the NBA. Hall of Fame type player. Hall of Fame type player, you know. <laughs> but but again, they're just you had a conversation with him because Jahidi White well, for all he's done in, in in his basketball career, he's still just a dude. He's no. still a guy that you can sit there and have a conversation a with. massive dude. Well, yes, yes. <laughs> Impressive. Yeah. But think about it. You had a conversation with him. You didn't You didn't go up to him, oh, Mr. White, can I speak to you? Can I get your autograph? You sat down, probably sat down next to him, introduced yourself. Just walk right up. Yeah, and had a conversation with him. Because you had some common ground there. Right. And, and what you realize is, again, these are just dudes. Talking to these kids, now they're high school kids playing basketball, but some of them are treated like superstars, especially the ones that go to the prep academies and the prep schools. They get treated at, at a different level, especially when they go to these major events and major tournaments. And they're getting recruited by all these you know, high-level college programs, so they're, they're wined and dined and, and treated like superstars. And then you sit down and talk to them, and they're just – they're just guys. Yeah, they're, they're they're high school kids who carry on a conversation, and, when, and it's neat. It's just it's the same thing I get to experience here with the Quincy High kids on on a daily you know weekly basis when I go out to practice or go to a game, and they come over and chat with me. And there were a number of kids from the shootout who just chatted with me. You know, I, had, I had a couple reach out to me on Twitter afterward. Hey, any chance you got any photos of us? But that was great, you know. But that's what makes that event so special is the teams that come in understand why they're here, what this is about, and respect it. They respect the fact people want to see them, people want to meet them, people want to chat with them. You know, they love basketball as much as all these basketball junkies that are sitting in the stands do. Yeah. So, you know, it is a basketball paradise. I had a fun conversation with Terry Copeland from Bergen Catholic, uh-huh. six Ooh, foot nine, massive, two hundred and twenty five pounds. Guy should be playing defensive end. Oh, I mean, if you didn't get a chance to see this dude, I mean, Mercy. he looks like a twenty five year old NFL player. I mean, ripped, yeah. phys- physically fit. I mean, yes. I, I said to him, I said, man, why are you not on the football field? <laughs> Did he laugh? You know, he laughed and. Said, oh, man, I get that a lot. He goes, I'm not a football player. I'm a basketball player. And getting a lot of Big East looks. I mean, yeah. you know, he, he's a little raw. I mean, if you got a chance to see Terry Copeland from yes. Bergen Catholic. He's Very out. good. He is good, um, but he's got a lot, you know, that he can can focus and work on. But just his frame was something out of a early NBA career kind of look. Yeah. I mean, he just looked like he was a man yeah. playing boys. Uh, we saw, But we saw that a lot this weekend, you know, and, and – Kansas City Staley had guys that physically looked massive compared to some of the guys they played against. And, you know, and, and it's why they handled the Blue Devils so well on Saturday night. They were just much more physical, much more mature, much stronger. Um, and, again, there's a, a – and I said, the first thing I said to Andy Douglas after the game, and Kansas City Staley won that game. Forget about the score. Doesn't matter what the spread was. They went out and won that game because of their physical size, their maturity, the fact they start five seniors who play the game so well and understand the game so well. First thing I said to Andy Douglas was, there's a big difference between sophomore and senior, not just in age. And that's the thing. And 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 if you I don't know if you had a chance to read what I wrote. I did. Um Andy heard his guys talking about that during the day how they need to get in the weight room, how they need to get bigger, stronger, faster. Watching these other teams going, how do you, com- how do you compete with that when I'm this size? So the, they, they know it. They acknowledge it. And it, it's what kind of work do they do to make that happen? I think Tyler Sprick was the one who said, 
I want to put on 20 or 30 pounds this off season, yeah. you know, of muscle. You know, I mean, that's what you want to see, right? That's why you play those games. Win yeah. or lose doesn't mean a lot if you lose. No. But you probably gain a lot more than you do if you don't play those games. And even if you do lose, you're seeing what's out there and you're seeing what you can aspire to be. I didn't I didn't get on my soapbox on social media on Saturday. That's I'll, too do, bad. I'll do it real briefly I want, here. I want to hear it. Uh, it's time to retire the black uniforms. <laughs> Already? Well, okay. Quincy High is 18-3. and three. Two of the three losses are in the black uniforms. I knew you'd have that stat. And at home, you had a chance to – you I, again, that just baffles that hurts me. That you, doesn't it? You don't like that. Well, I understand wearing the, the away uniforms. You do that, They do that in the Thanksgiving tournament. But you were in Blue Devil Gym and you're wearing black. Just – you could do a whole show podcast just on that. <laughs> and again, I again, it's a generational thing. The kids love it, and good for them. I'm just never going to be a fan of that. Even if they were black with sleeves. No. <laughs> Blue with sleeves or white with sleeves. Oh, I was going to say now. Now we're talking. Now we're talking Quincy tradition. Correct. Black is not Quincy tradition. That's my soapbox. I, uh, anyway, <laughs> we'll move on. <laughs> Other, just quick notes real quickly yeah. from this. Millard North out of Nebraska, back-to-back defending state champions. I got to see him Friday night against Bergen Catholic. Teams combined for 170 points. Um, I mean, in a high school I, game, you don't see 87, 83 no. as a final score. I, I saw them on Saturday against Father Tolton. They're fun. I mean, they are really fun to watch. They shoot it really well. They had, they had 13 uh, threes. Noah them. Mosser was great shooting the basketball on Saturday. Uh, the Miller North coach, Mustangs coach, Mike Etzel Miller, uh, fantastic guy. Yeah, and they just, were great. I think that was the thing that stood out to me more than anything is you you see a lot of these really good teams come in here. You see a lot of these prep academy teams come in here, and there's this stigma that comes with some of that, that they're basketball factories, that they're not doing it the right way. That uh, So you, you get this, in, this mental impression of – these are coaches that don't care about their kids. They're only caring about getting them to a D1 school and what name they can make for themselves. And that is so far from the truth. Just sitting and talking to these guys. Bill Armstrong from Link Academy. Just just great guy to have a conversation with. Had a great conversation with him after one of the games. Um, and that was the thing that jumped out at me. So many of these coaches were so wonderful to talk to, to have a co- conversation with. Um, and so many of them want to come back. So that was really neat. But, yes, I, I agree with you. Miller North was really, really good. Let's get into teams that we want to see in the future. I know that's a topic that we discussed about possibly getting into, Shuck, was teams that we both would like to potentially see in this event. Again, just yeah. kind of spitballing here. I mean, who knows what the you know what the yes. rules are and all that kind of stuff as far as trying to get teams here. But to me, the one that, that I would love to see come to this event. Now, we saw one Chicago Public League school here this year yeah, um, in Chicago Curie. We've seen others in the past. Chicago Corliss was here in the past. I want to see Chicago Simeon. I've got them on my list, yeah. To me, that, to me, that is when you talk, when you talk Chicago basketball, it starts with Simeon. Yes. Uh, Morgan Park would be right up there. If you get one, if you get a Whitney team like Young. Whitney Young, you get a team like that to come in. Again, those are teams that will draw fans uh, and play at a high level. And we're talking regular high school basketball, not academy teams, not prep school teams. These are Illinois high school teams that I think would be phenomenal to get in here. I had them on my list. I want to see like a Desmet out of St. Louis. Okay. I mean, we've seen SLU, we've seen. Chaminade, you know, we've seen, you know, the CBC Sean, was here last CBC. year. I mean, we've seen a lot of those, you know, really good St. Louis teams. Mm-hmm. I think DeSmet, they're ranked number one right now in Class 5. Would like to see uh, the Spartans come here and play. Okay. I've also got MICDS out of Country Day. You know, there's a connection locally here with their assistant coach, Marshall Newman, who used to do a lot with the Gus Macker. Right. You know, I think Country Day would be a fun team. They're okay. always highly ranked they're always, in Class yes. 3 always very good. Class 4. Class uh, 4, I believe. Yeah. Would like to see them here as well. I've got Simeon on my list. I mean, I've got. I'd like to see the best from Peoria. One, whoever the best yeah. team from Peoria come here. I like this year. I would have loved to have seen Sacred Heart Griffin. Yeah, I've got this. them too. You know, they're they're a Class Three A in Illinois, top level team, defending state champs. Um, if you if you could figure out a way, and I know you you got to schedule ahead, so it's not as easy to do as, as we say. Um, but if you could bring in the defending. 
3A or 4A state champion in Illinois if they return a group like, you know, team that won 4A last year, Glenn Barton West, um, didn't return anybody. So, but there are a bunch of other really good teams. But, yeah, so I, I, I think if you could find it, again, teams with a tie. You know, Father Tolton becomes a draw because it's got a Quincy guy coaching it and Jeremy Osborne, and it's why one of the reasons they come back every year. Um, over the years, we've had Shamanada a few years back had a kid whose mom and dad both went to Quincy University, uh, the, the Kazbuki kid, mm-hmm. um, who went on to play to Division One, play Division One basketball. Um, so I think I think finding local ties to certain teams helps with the draw. Um, but how cool would it be to see? See a really good Chicago Simeon. Wouldn't that be something? That would be awesome. And I know there's been conversations about that. Yeah. How do you make those things happen? Right. Get you're, able to bring, you're able to bring in teams from across the country. How do you get some of these teams from nearby to come in to fit it into their schedule? I will add. Yeah. And even I believe the uh, Staley coach mentioned that in your, your piece from this past weekend about Illinois and Indiana being the meccas of high school basketball. Yeah. Can we get a team from Indiana? Ben Davis, somebody from over in the Indianapolis area, you know, Indiana yeah. high school basketball, get them to come here and could take you, in the atmosphere. Could you get one of those teams that's traditionally in the, the top ten in Indiana? How, how cool would it be to get, you know, and, and I'd have to do my research to know who the right opponent would be, but to get one of those dripping with tradition teams out of Indiana that's going to be good, and pair them against Quincy High. Yeah, you have one of the winningest teams in, in Illinois history in the nation. You could get one of those winningest programs out of Indiana and have them go head to head on a Saturday night. That would draw. <laughs> it would, wouldn't it? Eric Stratman, there's your challenge. Right, get it done. I believe Ben <laughs> Davis right now is the best team in Indiana, and they're traditionally strong in everything. But yeah. they're a, they're a nationally ranked team right now. Or or even go down to to some of those uh, blue blood programs in Kentucky. That you know that have that tradition, uh, that long-standing tradition. I, 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 again, you're looking for teams to play Quincy. You know, it's easy to go. Okay, we'll bring in Link Academy, and okay, we'll go get this other prep school out of Dallas or this prep school out of Atlanta or Utah. Like Wasatch Valley was so good. Yeah. Um, that I'm glad. I'm glad he brought them in. They were a lot of fun to watch, but. For Quincy High, you're always trying to find a team that's comparable. And I thought Staley was was great. Staley has some tradition, you know, especially recently finished third in the state last year. Um, I thought that was a great matchup. Quincy High is going to be really good the next couple of years. They have a ton of talent. So go find somebody, but find something that adds a little intrigue. You know, bringing Webster Groves with Courtney Ramey in in that first shootout against Aaron Shute and the Blue Devils was a great matchup. Yeah, you know. Slew. Yeah, was fun. last year with Nick Kramer. Yeah, great matchup. So I love your idea. Go to Indiana, you know, another hotbed of basketball, high school basketball. Find somebody to bring in yeah. to play Quincy. Go tradition versus tradition. It would draw. Uh, you know, and, and like you mentioned, you could throw out all kinds of academies and prep schools and stuff like that. That you know, IMG would be a would be kind of a you know they're always you know one of those schools that everybody you know, yeah. kind of attaches themselves to as far as being one of the, you know, elite, right. you know, academies in all of the country. Prolific Prep is another team I mentioned earlier out yep. of California that would be good. Um, and, of course, Mott Verde Academy out of Florida, which is the number one team right now in, in the country. Yeah. And, and could you imagine if you got Mott Verde to come in and play Link next year? <laughs> right wow. before the Blue Devil game? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> You'd have ESPN here. Yeah, no question. So great shootout, great job by Eric Stratton, yeah. great job by a lot of people who helped him along the way. And and you you take that deep breath after it's over, and what a great week! And you've there's been this build up, you've been looking forward to it, and then you realize we got six more weeks of basketball. You know we're 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 not even close to being done with the regular season. Then you got the postseason, um, so you got to gear yourself back up. You know mentally, you get you take that deep breath like okay, let's get back into it. And, and we got to get back into it quick because we got a lot of stuff going on here in the next couple of weeks with some some killer matchups um, that are going to influence conference championship races um, across the board, boys and girls, teams that are looking to, to create 
leverage for the postseason. Mm-hmm. So I, I, the next few weeks are going to be a lot of fun too. You're going to see some of the repeated matchups in, in some regards, but but those are fun because yeah. now there's something, you know, on well, the line. On the Missouri side, you'll see the Palmyres, the Monroe Cities, the Highlands, the, you know, all play each other for, what, the 12th time this season or something. And, and I understand. I understand why they get in each other's tournaments, and they don't always face each other in those tournaments. But it's like, okay, you're going to play in this tournament, this tournament, this tournament, and you're going to play each other in conference and – Mix it up a little, little bit. much, yeah, a little much. But so, like you said, there, you don't have a large number of schools no. within a certain radius right. of, of of mileage in order to play, so it so, makes a lot of sense. I totally understand it. Yeah. So on the Illinois side, though, you've got some really key matchups oh, in the next couple of weeks. One big one looming a week from Friday at Blue Devil Gym. Moline comes to town Man. with good luck getting a seat for that with the conference title on the line. You know, should Quincy take care of business this week? Uh, as we tape this, they're headed to Rock Island Alleman for a Tuesday night game, and then they go to Sterling on Friday night. Take care of those two, then you play Moline. Quincy with one loss. If Moline takes care of business this week, Moline, no losses in conference. Yeah. So the conference title is on the line. You know, obviously there's a few more games after that that they both would have to sustain. But if Quincy wants any shot at the title, it has to be Moline here at home. Is that a potential postseason matchup as well? It very well could be. They're both in the same sectional. They're in different subsectionals. Um, but they're both in the same sectional. And Moline is the sectional host. So you might have to, to, to beat Moline, state-ranked Moline, to get to the super. You're probably going to have to beat them on their own floor. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Gotta love those yeah. postseason matchups. And, you know, and we talk so much basketball here, and rightly so. But we can't we can't forget about the grapplers out there because this weekend's a big grappling weekend here in Quincy. The Quincy Notre Dame tournament is going on on Saturday. Mm-hmm. Draws all the local, you know, all the area teams. I, you know, as far as I know, Central, West Hancock, Pittsfield. I think Macomb will be there. I'm not sure on Macomb. I double check that one. Uh, last year, Palmyra was there. I'm assuming they'll be there again this year. I haven't seen the whole list. But, you know, that's a full day of wrestling at the pit Mm -hmm. um, with a lot of – with all our – you know, our our best chances of kids going to state from the area taking place there. Cross town this year on Saturday, get the Western Big Six Championships going on. Quincy's the host this year. So, Owen Uppinghouse, who is undefeated still on the season at 160 pounds, Briar Newbold at 182, Max Miller at 170. All guys that could very well win a Western Big Six title for the Blue Devils. Uh, and then you're going to see some really, really good wrestlers from Moline, Rock Island, Sterling, all who are coming in, you know, and Geneseo. Right. You know, the rest of the Big Six schools. So it should be a great day of wrestling at Quincy High School. Um, and then they start the postseason. Isn't that something? That was quick. That yeah, was quick. So, yeah. you know, they're, they're, the wrestling postseason starts first weekend of February. Western Big Six, an underrated wrestling conference, especially with the additions of Sterling and Geneseo. Well, I think you, for, you, know, you forget the Quad Cities, how good wrestling is there because of their ties to Iowa. Iowa has such great wrestling, but that's carried over to the, the Illinois side of the Quad Cities. So I think there's going to be some phenomenal matches this weekend uh, out of Quincy High School. All right, we've got uh, we got to get to these top five play We, we have to. We have to. I mean, that was the request this week via email. Excellent. Uh, again, our listeners have done a great job of chiming in, giving us their thoughts. We've, I've gotten messages, text messages. I've gotten tweets. I've gotten emails. So, again, uh, hit us up. You know, sports at muddyrivernews.com comes right to me. We'll, if you have an idea for us for a top five ranking that we can dive into, let us know if you got a question, you got a topic you want us to discuss. Yeah, you want to go off on us? Yeah. Mm, please do. Please. So sports at MoneyRiverNews.com yeah. or hit me up on Twitter at Shuck Sports. Um, you can DM me. You can, my DMs are always open. Um, you can slide into Shuck's DMs. Slide on in. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so here we go. This week's top five rankings. Best favorite play-by-play announcer. Right. Our top five. I'm going to let you kick it off at number five. Okay, let's real quick again preface that, that this is a our favorites. It's not a what we think are the best of all time. Correct. All right. 
Uh, I've got, again, I've got two lists of new and of all time. I will give you my, my, or excuse me, current top five and my top five all time. My fifth all time is the voice of college football. Keith Jackson, Jackson. is, uh, is fifth on my list of all time. Uh, my favorite current Dan Schulman out of ESPN, I think oh. is a tremendous uh, voice of the blue Jays. Yes. And then also does a lot of college basketball. Correct. That would, that would be number five on the list. I like that. I like that call. Um, I only made one list. Now, on my list, four of the five are currently active. My number one on that list is not active. Gotcha. But Keith Jackson, if I had, if I had done a list of all-time greats, he would be my number two. Ooh. Yes, wow. He would be my number That's two. That's high. Very high. Whoa, Nelly. <laughs> so, but as far as my list goes, my favorite, and I'm going to the college ranks. Okay. Well, the University of Illinois. Ooh. I thoroughly enjoy listening to Brian Barnhart call a game. I, he, he calls it the right way. I know what's going on. Uh, has a great delivery, very informative, and captivates me when I'm listening to a game on the radio. Interesting. That's so, a good choice. So Brian Barnhart would be my number five of my favorite play-by-play guys. You know what I like about that is because you could have said Mike Kelly, Mizzou. Yeah. He was very strong in his own right. But I like you. You went to Illinois to get that one. Because, you know, I just, I again, if in Illinois, if I'm driving in the truck and so I happen to catch an Illinois game on the radio, he's the reason I listen. I like it. Uh, my number four all time, and you probably debate me on this. You probably have him a little higher. I got Vince Scully uh, as my favorite. He's my number four okay. uh, um, of all time. Current Brad Nessler, who does SEC football on CBS. Yep. I've always been a big fan of his from a play-by-play perspective. Um, just solid, you know, gives me yes. everything that I want, uh, you know, steps back and lets the color analyst speak as well. I think that's what it takes from a strong play-by-play guy, especially on television, yeah. is to step aside. And, and, and you know, uh, on radio, you do 75% of the talking. Right. On television, it's almost it's the opposite. You know, it's almost yeah. like the color guy does 75% of the talking. Because you're talking over pictures and la di da, you don't have to give a lot of play by play. You just have to be very solid. You have to you have to engage the viewer, is what you have to do. Correct. And know when to be quiet, and just let the viewer see the play, and when to add to it. And he does a great job of that. Yeah. I, I'll give you that. Fantastic. Uh, my number four. We're going to the world of hockey. I debated this one. Okay. Um. This guy to me, is the best hockey announcer there's ever been. If I was doing a all-time or retired or former list, Dan Kelly would be on that list. But on this list, Doc Emmerich. Yep. Doc Emmerich. Uh, to me, there is no one better calling a hockey game, period. I don't care which market you're in. I don't care if you're in Canada or the United States, Russia. I do not care. Doc Emmerich's the best. I've got him as my number three. You took the words out of my mouth. He's just incredible. To be able to watch him and hear him during a Blues Stanley Cup championship and just to be able to not only have your one of your favorites and then you got your team all yeah. in one right. was magical. Um, I also put, I know that's just not a play-by-play play thing, but but Darren Pang is also one of my favorites from a color analyst perspective. I would agree with that. Um, I enjoy him as well. My my uh, my top five current number three would be Jason Benetti, who does the Chicago White Sox. Okay. Um, and then, of course, does a lot of national stuff. Okay. I don't listen to him enough to be able to give you a good opinion on him. I think you should. I'm, I will have to now. He has cerebral palsy, palsy, and he still, you know, he doesn't allow that to get into the way of what he does. I think his whole story is just phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and and he's, very cool. he's obviously very good yeah. at what he does. Again, I have not listened to him enough, but I will have to dig into that so that I can. Uh, my number three goes to the NFL. Okay. Uh, again, I, and I've done mostly radio guys here, like as I was thinking play by play, there are certain TV guys I really like, um, some that other people do not like. like I like Joe Buck. I know that I know he's a very polarizing guy <laughs> when it comes to the extremely. I like him. I, I, I like his delivery and all that. He's not my number three, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> but I'm just saying there are TV guys that do NFL games that I like. But when it comes to play-by-play, to me, the guy that, that sets the, the standard for me is Mitch Holdhouse for the Kansas State Chiefs. You're right. He is very good. Yes. Just, and, again, 
again, I know my my picks are more regional because that's what I listen to. Um, so that that matters to me that I can flip on the radio and let, pick up a Kansas State Chiefs game and listen to Mitch Holdhouse. Yep. And I know what I'm going to get. And I know you know the the iconic touchdown call, touchdown Kansas City. Yes. You know, just simple, but the way he says it just resonates. My number two on the list is is my favorite baseball broadcaster of all time, and that's Jack Buck. I mean, I, I just don't know of anybody that can hold a candle to him when it comes. I mean, Vince Scully, obviously, but it's more of a again. These are your favorites. These are people that yes. you you favorite more yeah. so than again. What you we're think not is talking. Great. These are our, the five best of all time. These right. are our favorites. Yeah. So he's uh, he's up there. I mean, he was my soundtrack growing up. I mean, right. I can specifically rem- remember. You know, uh, sneaking my radio into my bed to listen to West Coast games at 11 o'clock at night. Yep. You know, those were those are memories that stick with you. And Jack Buck gave you those memories did. and did it in such an incredible way. And he and Mike Shannon, not a Mike Shannon fan. I apologize to all those folks out there. I mean, I, I think the world of him as a storyteller um, more so than I do as a broadcaster. Um, but the two of them and the way that they, right. you know, mix together, I think is phenomenal. My, my, my current Pat Hughes. I mean, I, Cubs, I'm not a Cubs guy, no, but Pat Hughes I. is a phenomenal play-by-play broadcaster. He, he does a tremendous job. My number two is in the baseball realm as well. John Miller. Sunday Night Baseball was must-see TV for me, not only because I love baseball, but listening to him. And he and Joe Morgan were a great team in that booth um but john miller you know got his start as a radio guy yeah you know um calling games for the san francisco giants is where he became known for um and then obviously sunday night baseball but what a smooth voice what an iconic voice you you hear it and you know who it is right just he starts talking and it's just the way he just brings you right into the broadcast. You feel like you're sitting on a couch watching a game with him. Which which should be the case. Yes. And that's what you want to be. You want to feel like you're at the game. I'm um, my number one of all time from a uh, uh, my favorite of all time, Bob Costas. I mean, he's just always been there for as a St. Louis guy um, for any sport. I just thought he was great at everything he did. I mean, he was what made him so good, I think, is that he could do any sport at any time yeah. and perfect it. Um, and, and I thought, for me anyway, that Bob Costas is number one of all time. I've got my number one current is Ian Eagle. I mean, I think that he is yeah. what again another guy that can, especially the NCAA tournament. Um, you know, he yeah. can. He he's just you know he just has it. He just has the it factor. He does a lot of NFL football. Um, he's he's phenomenal. Is there okay? Is there a better NCAA tournament duo? Than Ian Eagle and Jim Spinarkle. <laughs> Talk about iconic voices of the yeah. NCAA tournament. No, there isn't. And that, that, I don't think. You, you, you want them calling an NCAA tournament game. Like, you can go up and down the line of who's calling what games, but if those two are calling the game, you know you're in for a treat. Yeah. Better than Nance and Grant Hill and anybody else yeah. to try and put on there. Even though I like Bill Raftery, too. I mean, I yeah. thought he was a great NCAA tournament voice. You brought up a name there, and Jim Nance, that – is like is iconic in the in the business when when he calls golf it's phenomenal it is it really i mean it just he's, he's really good at basketball but 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 golf is i mean he's the voice of the masters yeah. i mean he just is yeah. he just is yeah so I mean, again he's not in my top five me either man he he belongs in the conversation i thought that was an easy choice that's why i didn't put him on there you know my number one's jack buck and you said it um Voice of voice of my life, you know, my cardinal fandom. Yeah, you know, so much. And again, my parents let me listen to the West Coast games on the on the radio as I fell asleep. And they'd come in and turn the radio off as they came to bed because I'd fall out of our well, I've already fallen asleep. But yeah, you know, I went to sleep to Jack Buck. Yep, me too. I mean, there you go. Right. And it, it, you, you know, you mentioned Bob Costas. Being able to call so many different sports. Jack Buck did too. I think people forget that. They they associate him with the Cardinals and with baseball. But he was a one heck of a football announcer. Yeah. Um, and, and called so many different things. He has the famous call of the Dwight Clark reception, I think, in the back of the end zone for the yeah. 49ers. I know it's against your – I know. I'm sorry. I didn't mean Thanks to bring it up. so much. Fresh off the great performance this past Sunday. Was that just miserable? <laughs> when, when are the Cowboys going to get an actual quarterback again? We had Tony Slow Mo. Right. And now we have Duck Prescott. <laughs> Ugh. Drives me nuts. 
Thanks. I apologize. Anyway, um, but we could go on and on about Correct. great broadcasters. There's one I listed as an honorable mention to my list. And unfortunately, people don't get to hear him do play-by-play much anymore. Right. But he's a guy that I actually had a chance to work with, who I think is out of this world. And I'm so lucky to be working with him again. And that would be you, Mr. Mark. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. I, I, don't, I don't think people realize, obviously, your career took a different direction from play-by-play um, when you first came to Quincy to TV sportscaster, you know, sports director, WGM, to the things you're doing now. But when you were doing play-by-play for radio, um, you were top of the charts. I appreciate that, man. And you and I had a great time doing being able to do some of the QHS and Q&D games together. We did. On TV. One thing were, I never highlights. One thing I never got to do, and I hope someday I do, is, is, is call a Blue Devil basketball game. I never once really? got to call a Quincy High basketball game. Just, you know, outside of the Crosstown show. Well, we, we do have a way we could probably make that happen. Really? There's got to be a way here at Muddy River that we could stream a call of Blue Devil basketball with you and I on the call. Wouldn't that be fun? We're going to make it happen. David Adam on the uh, sidelines? No, we don't want him or No, no, I'm just, I just he's just a big, He's there. just a big schmuck. Yeah. yeah. Great interview. Oh, wait, somebody just walked into our studio. <laughs> I will tell you, and you both are very good at this, but David Adam is, is a tremendous – I always used to listen to the post-game shows yeah. because he's a great interviewer. He always had the right questions, and it may annoy a coach or just like you guys. You, you guys are great question askers, and that's what I enjoyed on the post game shows. That's what you got to do is you got to ask questions. Correct. Otherwise, so, you don't get answers. That's our top five for this week. Top five favorite play-by-play guys. Let us know what you think. Again, sports at muddyrivernews.com. You can email us. You can find us on Twitter. You can DM us. You can see us at a game and – Give us your opinion, and I'm sure people will. Yes, I hope they will. Top five writers. We got to do that sometime. Ooh, we will have. We will have to do that. Yeah. Rick Hummel may make the list. <laughs> he is all of that. Chuckman might make the list. So, anyway, that was fun. It was good. So next week, who knows what our top five will be next week? We'll see what our listeners say because that's where it's coming from each and every week. And last week's top five got cut off of the podcast. We'll redo that. So we have to revisit that one, but. Again, thanks for coming in. Good to see you, man. This has been the Muddy River Breakdown with my trusty sidekick, Benji. I'm Shuckles. (laughs) Check us out next week. Muddy River Sports. Our home, our sports.